Thank you, Carolyn. Good morning, church. Glad to see that you came at the right time. Uh, hopefully, uh, there will be more that will join us in the weeks to come. If you would, please go ahead and open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. Today, we're going to be looking at just the first seven verses, but make no mistake about it, these seven verses in Acts chapter 6 are, are pretty weighty. And uh, it has a lot of ramifications, a lot of... Uh, uh, things for us to learn and glean from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Let me remind you a little bit about what's taken place in the book of Acts up until this point. Uh, if you remember, Acts starts with Jesus Christ being resurrected back to life after being hung on, hanged on a cross and in the tomb for three graves or three days. And then he appears to different various groups of people over the course of 40 days. And Acts chapter 1 starts with Christ's ascension back into heaven. And before he begins to ascend, he commissions his disciples to go be his witnesses. And with that comes the birth of the church. And so with the absence of Jesus in the world, we were given and we were blessed with the gift of having one another. And this community of Jesus followers, the early church, was deeply devoted to God and to Jesus. So much so that they were continually studying God's word together. They were learning about the life and the ministry of Jesus together. Uh, they were remembering Christ's death on the cross together. They were praying together. Are you getting the idea? They were simply together. They were united. And then we come to Acts chapter 5. And do you remember what happened in Acts chapter 5? We learned about this internal threat to the church. It's interesting. It took four chapters for Satan to try to effectively tear apart the church. And in Acts chapter 5, we learn about this couple, this married couple named Ananias and Sapphira. And Ananias and Sapphira, they were this couple who wanted to appear generous. They cared more about what people thought about them than what they were actually doing with their actions. And so they had some property. That's not a sin, to own some property. They sold some property. Not a sin, to sell some property. They gave the money to the church. It's not a sin to give some of the money to the church. But if you remember how the story ends with Ananias and Sapphira, it ends with them uh, being carried out in body bags. They die. What happened? The sin came when Ananias and Sapphira lied about what they gave to the church. They said they gave all the money to the church. And when confronted time and time again, both of them given an opportunity to repent, both maintained the lie. And first Ananias died and was carried out, and then three hours later his wife was carried out dead as well. God decided to step in and deal with it very personally. Why did he do that? Why did Ananias and Sapphira have to? That seems a little extreme to have them drop dead in the church, does it not, to anybody else? I think the reason that God did that was to send a very strong and sobering message to his church. And the message that he sent is this, I care very deeply about the purity of my bride. As we learned early on in this sermon series, who is the church? Church isn't the four walls of this building. If Burnside Christian Church burnt to the ground tomorrow, Burnside Christian Church would still exist because the church is the people. And so when God is sending this message about, hey, I care very deeply about the purity of my bride, He's not interested in the cleanliness of the building. He's interested in the condition of our hearts. And he sends this very strong message that we're not going to tolerate. We're not going to tolerate any type of hypocrisy in the church. Think about that just for a minute. God cares about the purity of his church because 
It's hypocrisy that the world looks at in the church and mocks. Well, I can't go to church. I won't go to church because the church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. It's our purity that separates us from the rest of the world. And God is sending a very strong message that, look, I'm taking this very seriously. We're not having any pretenders in the church. And in Acts chapter 5, he stepped in and squelched the threat. Unity, purity, is very important. Well, now we come to Acts chapter 6, a chapter later. And Satan is trying his best to once again tear apart the church. Only this time it's not sin. This time it's interpersonal conflict. Have you ever been a part of a church where there's been some conflict in the church? Two sides, both claiming to be right. One side claiming the other side has wronged them in some way. And maybe the, it was such a big deal that the conflict led to division within the church. Maybe that's how some of you ended up here. You were part of a church that was torn apart by conflict. I absolutely love how relevant, practical, applicable God's Word is. Because today we learn that conflict happens in all churches... Yes, even the very first church. And did you know that interpersonal conflict is one of the major, it's the top, one of the top three reasons that people leave their church. They're tired of fighting and backbiting and complaining, and so they decide they're going to move on and join a different body of believers. But here's what you need to understand. Conflict is inevitable. It's going to happen. When you have imperfect people sharing life together in close proximity, that's what the church is supposed to be, right? We're supposed to be doing life together as we follow Jesus. And so when you have a church filled with imperfect people, anybody in here perfect? <laughs> I know it's your birthday, Mitch. We might give you a pass, okay? We're all imperfect people. And when you have a group of imperfect people who are doing life together in close proximity, you're going to bump heads once in a while. Friction's going to happen. And it's how to handle that conflict that becomes vitally important. And the good news is, Acts chapter 6 teaches us what to do when conflict happens. Because they faced it. The title of this morning's sermon is When Conflict Comes. And I've chosen that very specifically. It's not a matter of if conflict comes. It's a matter of when. When conflict comes, what to do. Uh, follow along this morning as I read our text. Acts chapter 6, the first seven verses, verse 1. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number. Now here's where I want to pause just for a moment. Because isn't this always how it seems to happen? Things are going great. Everything's going smooth. And then wham, out of nowhere, it seems like things go off track, things go sideways, things get flipped upside down. And for the early church, you have to understand, things were going awesome. They were growing numerically, they were loving one another like family, they were regularly meeting together and caring for one another, they were increasing in number. But then notice, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. We're going to explain that verse a little bit later on. Verse 2. So the twelve summoned together the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. By the way, verse 6 is not an apostolic succession. They weren't passing on miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. They weren't even passing on the Holy Spirit. This was the first recorded ordination service. 
they were coming together as the leaders of the church, praying together over the men who've been selected to serve in the church, and they were laying their hands on them to say, look, we approve of these men to do the ministry that they're about to do. That's all this is. Verse 7, the word of God kept on spreading and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. So what's awesome is in our text this morning, I don't know if you saw it or not, but what I was studying this last week, I found three things in our text. The first thing that I found was why conflict happens. The second reason, second thing that I found in this text is what, how conflict is resolved. And the third thing that I noticed in these verses is the results of resolved conflict. And so first we're going to explore this idea of why conflict happens. Go back and read verse 1. Now at that time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So let me explain what's happening here in this verse. Do you remember? If you've been following with us as we've been studying through the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, do you remember? People had property. They would sell that property. They would take the money that they got from that property. They would lay it at the feet of the apostles and give it and distribute it as they saw fit. Acts chapter 5, a man by the name of Barnabas sold some property, took the money from that land, laid it at the apostles' feet so they could distribute it as they saw fit. What's happening here in verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, is that apparently... The apostles took that money and bought some food. And what they were doing is that they were distributing this food among the widows that were existing within the congregation of the church there in Jerusalem. But what you need to also understand is you need to know that the church was made up of two groups of people. The church was made up of Jewish people. And what made them Jewish was two things. First of all, their beliefs, their faith. They believed in the Old Testament. They believed in the law of Moses. But also their ethnicity made them Jewish. They were Jews because they were descended from the bloodline of Abraham. Remember, Father Abraham had many sons, right? These guys were descendants of Father Abraham. They had part of Abraham's blood coursing through their veins. That's what made them Jewish. But then you had another group of Jews that existed in the church. They were known as the Hellenistic Jews. What's that all about? Well, those were people who had a bloodline not traced from Abraham, but instead they had a heritage that was Greek. Uh, that came back from Alexander the Great when he was conquering all the lands and he conquered Jerusalem area and, and, and some Greeks stayed behind and lived in Jerusalem. Well, guess what? Many, 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 many years later they had families. And they grew up becoming Greeks, but they became Jewish Greeks, Greek-speaking Jews. And uh, these two groups did not get along. The, 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 the uh, Hebrews, the native Jews, thought that they were better than the Greek-speaking Jews because we have the right blood, we've got the right family tree, we, we speak the right language, uh, we worship in the right place. And then you had Greek-speaking Jews who were looked down on by the native Hebrews. So these two groups of Jews existed in the church, and this conflict had been brewing for a long time before Jesus was ever introduced to them. But anyway, Acts chapter 6 happens, and you have these two groups of Jews, and they don't get along. And why did this conflict happen? Well, did you notice... It all started with a complaint. It says a complaint arose among them. Now, here's the thing that you need to understand. Complaints are nothing new. And not all complaints are bad. But here's the thing, and this is what separates, I believe, Acts chapter 6 from a lot of what's happening in churches in America in 2022. Uh, this was a legitimate complaint. A lot of what happens in churches across America aren't legitimate complaints. How do I know that this was a legitimate complaint? The complaint was um, our widows, our Greek uh, Jewish widows are being overlooked as you're distributing food to them. Our Greek widows are being overlooked. 
It's a legitimate, how do I know it's a legitimate complaint? Because scripture addresses it. In James chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You see, back in Bible times, there was no welfare system. Widows and orphans had to depend upon the kindness of others. So it was the responsibility and the duty of the church to shoulder the burden of meeting the needs of widows and orphans. And so this was a legitimate complaint by the Hellenistic Jews. Our, our, our widows are being overlooked. They have no way to take care of themselves. You're taking care of, of the native Hebrews, the native Jews, but what about our widows? They're being overlooked. It's a legitimate complaint. But sadly, most conflict, most division that exists in churches is based upon not legitimate complaints, but what? Selfish complaints. And there's a difference there. And I'm, if that's such an important line, I want to say it again. Most conflict and division that has existed in American churches today isn't because of legitimate complaints. It's because of selfish complaints. And I think you need to understand that not all complaints are legitimate. I read an article just on Friday from E2, Effective Elders. Our elders have met with E2. Uh, some of them were the professors for my master's courses. Read an article that was written by David Roadcup. David Roadcup wrote an article on Friday that he was having to meet as a consultant with a church because of conflict that threatened to divide this particular church. Guess what the conflict was about? Music style. Ugh. Aren't we over that? Haven't we beaten that dead horse to death yet? Now, is that a legitimate complaint or not? Well, I don't know. How, how can you tell if it's a legitimate complaint? Here's a really simple way that you can ask yourself if a complaint is a legitimate complaint or not. Ask yourself, does this matter to God? Do you think God cares if he's worshipped with drums or with a pipe organ? Do you think God cares what color the carpet is? Do you think God cares what temperature the building is kept at? Do you think God cares if coffee's allowed in the auditorium? Do you think God cares what time the worship service meets on Sunday morning? Do you think God cares whether or not his word is preached with a suit and tie? Not all complaints are equal. Not all complaints are legitimate. But all conflict begins with a complaint. And before you complain, you need to ask yourself, is this a legitimate complaint? Second reason that conflict happens is an assumption was made. When you have a complaint about someone who's done something, be very careful not to insert an assumption. Because in our text... An assumption is very subtly inserted in text. And you may have even missed it. The middle of verse 1 says, A complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked. Anything you notice about that verse? Who was doing the complaining? Was it the widows that were doing the complaining? Hey, over here, we, we, we didn't get any food. Was it the widows that were doing the complaining? No. It was other Greek Jews who were complaining on behalf of the widows. Who were like, can you believe the injustice? Would you look at that? And, and, and it, it wasn't the widows raising, it was the group of Greek speaking Jews who were raising it. And listen, an assumption comes into play. Because what they were doing was they were assigning motive. They were like, we know why you aren't giving the Hellenistic Jewish widows any food. And it's because you don't like them. It's because we're not of your own people. It's because we don't speak like you do. That's why you're neglecting them. It's because you don't like them as much as you like the genuine Jews. Now that's a strong accusation. Don't ever assume that you know why people do what they do. You have no idea what's going on in the hearts or in the minds of individuals. Unless you're God, 
You don't know what people are thinking or what is in their heart. And here in the context, I believe an assumption is being made. I know why our widows have been, have been neglected. It's because of their ethnicity. Is that why? Were the apostles prejudiced? Were they racist? That's not at all why. It was an oversight. It was a mistake, a legitimate mistake, one that needed to be corrected, but it was a mistake. And how many times does conflict begin and grudges get hold, held and resentment gets started because you make an assumption about a motive? Well, well he's not doing that because he's lazy. She's intentionally leaving me out because she hates me. He's asking for that because he's greedy. And we assume the worst about people that we already don't like. Isn't that right? Isn't that why conflict happens? Because we've made an assumption. We assume we know why they're doing what they're doing and why they're saying what they're saying. And we jump to conclusions that are misappropriated. That's how conflict starts. And that's why we have conflict. There was a complaint. There were some assumptions that were made. Now let's move on to the second lesson that we learned about conflict because it's a little more positive. It's a little more helpful. And that is, how is conflict resolved? Returning to our text, look at verses 2 through 6. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these were brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. Something I just want to point out to you uh, here really quickly in these verses. Did you notice that the conflict itself gets one verse of Scripture? The solution, the resolution to the conflict gets five verses of Scripture. And that's about right. I have found in my ministry experience that it takes about five times as much effort and time and resources to resolve a conflict than it does to state one. And that's why it's really, really important that you make sure that your complaint is legitimate because it's going to eat up a lot of resources of leadership if you raise a complaint. Make sure it's a legitimate complaint that God himself is passionate about okay but here's things and this is how conflict is resolved notice that the church leaders kept first things first did you notice verse 2 points out that the apostles addressed the rest of the church and reminded them of what they themselves were to be doing they said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. And verse 4 says, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. They were keeping the main thing, what? The main thing. Even when there was a squeaky wheel, they didn't let them get sidetracked and be like, uh-oh, we better stop what we're doing and make sure these people are kept happy. They saw that it was a legitimate need, that it was a legitimate concern, that there was some oversight. But instead of them taking themselves away from what it was they were called to do, they assigned others to do that ministry that could be done. It's not desirable for us to neglect the Word of God in order to serve tables. And that's a good word that I need to hear. That's a good word for our elders to hear. And notice, nobody's saying, well, why can't you do both? Why can't you pray and preach and serve tables? Nobody's saying that. Well, what's the matter with you guys? Are you lazy? Are you too good to serve tables? Do you not care about us? Nobody's asking these questions. And were those questions deserving of a yes answer? No, of course not. Not. 
The apostles weren't lazy or lacked compassion, and they definitely didn't think of themselves as too good to serve. It was simply that they understood what they were called and gifted to do, and they had to make sure that they were doing what they were called to do. And serving tables wasn't what they were called to do. Nothing wrong with serving tables to widows. Nothing wrong with distributing food to those who have need. But it wasn't what they themselves were called to do. One scholar pointed this out, and I think it's worth repeating. You have to remember that at this time when Acts chapter 6 was written, Christians aren't being slapped around or imprisoned or beaten for feeding and caring for widows. But they were being beaten and imprisoned for preaching the gospel. And the apostles say, that's our job, folks. We've been called to do that. We're going to do that. That is the ministry that God called them to. And it involved serious consequences, and they weren't going to stop. And the apostles were doing what no one else would do or could do. The apostles were committed to doing what God himself gifted them and commissioned them to do. Look, there's a lot of needs at Burnside Christian Church. I can't possibly fulfill every single need out there. And if you're expecting me to, or if you're expecting our elders to meet every single need in this, you're going to be let down. You're going to be disappointed. I'm just telling you. And that's why our deacons are so valuable here at Burnside Christian Church. It's not a lesser position. Don't ever think to yourself, well, you know, this is a lesser position. That's not at all what this is. Jesus himself was a servant leader. He was washing feet. There's a, it's a noble thing to serve those that you love in the body of Christ. And the office, the title of deacon, is one that's super important. And because we have deacons, it frees the elders up and myself up to do what we feel we've been called and commissioned by God to do. And the apostles knew that they couldn't possibly meet all of the needs. And so that leads us to the second thing that they did to resolve the conflict. Did they ignore the need? Did they ignore the complaint? Did they think, those people are just being petty? They didn't ignore the complaint. What did they do? They included others and invited others to step in and serve. And so they appointed uh, seven men to do this. And these seven men... Uh, fit the qualifications needed to fulfill the ministry role. Um, real quick, I'll touch on it and then we'll fly away, okay? Did you notice there wasn't a vote? Did you notice it wasn't like, let's put these names on a ballot and let's all take a vote and approve them? That wasn't how this happened, okay? The apostles said, choose from among yourselves. Select from among yourselves. Not elect, select from among yourselves. Who fits the qualifications needed to do this role? And guess what? The seven men that were selected were all Greeks. Did you see that? You may have missed it. All seven names are Greek names. And that's significant. Because I love how this thinking might have played out. They're like, Look, just to show you that we have no ill will against Greek-speaking Jews, we're going to appoint Greek-speaking Jews to fulfill this ministry. I also think it's interesting that maybe the, those who were complaining about this, they were the first ones who got volunteered to serve and do it. Like, hey, you're exactly right. This is a problem. You should do something about that. And if the widows are Greek speakers, think about this. In order to serve them well, you need people who can speak Greek. Isn't that great? And I love verse 5. It says, and the whole congregation approved of this decision. I had to laugh. Dr. David Jeremiah said, this was one of the most overlooked and underrated miracles of the apostles. They made a decision that pleased the entire church. In all seriousness, though, uh, we need servants. The church needs servants. Jesus said, pray for the workers. We need more workers. We don't need a church that's filled with Christians who are sitting on the sidelines complaining about something and how it's being done or how something's not being done. If you see something not being done, come talk to us. It's probably a, an oversight or something that we feel like would be a good idea. 
but be careful because you might be the first one we ask to do it. Well, we've looked at how, why conflict exists and how to resolve conflict. The last thing I want to touch on is this. I want to talk about the results of resolved conflict. Wrapping up our text this morning, look at verse 7 specifically. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Um, isn't that wonderful? So many things were happening. So many great and wonderful things were taking place. And the results I see are twofold in this verse. And it's kind of like, you know, reading between the lines a little bit. And there's two things that actually happened. And the first thing that actually happened was that unity was maintained. There was this conflict, there was this complaint that had the potential to tear apart the church. But notice they didn't split. The Greek-speaking Jews didn't go off and form another church that was the first Christian Greek-speaking Jewish church of Christ. Uh, they were together through thick, through thin, for better for worse, we're a family, we're going to tough this thing out. And listen, unity matters to God. It matters supremely to God. He wants his kids to get along. Unity was maintained. Second thing I want you to see from there is that the word of God was able to be spread. Because unity was maintained, because there, uh, the apostles weren't distracted from prayer and from the ministry of the word, the word of God kept on spreading and the number of disciples kept increasing greatly. Some translations use the phrase multiplied greatly. And I want to point out to you a little bit about God's math. Because early in Acts chapter 2, we're told that, and there were 3,000 that were added to their number that day. And there kept being added day by day people who were brought to faith. By the time we get to Acts chapter 6, it's no longer addition. It's multiplication. That's God's math. And notice at the end of verse 7, even priests were coming to Jesus. They were believing in him. That's remarkable. And the way that they were able to witness and to spread God's word effectively was because they were unity was maintained. A church that divides, a church that splits, has lost effectiveness when it comes to sharing God's love and unity to a community. Be because they strive to be together and maintain unity, they were able to spread the word effectively, but also because um, they were also able not to be distracted with things, the ministry could continue to move forward. I'm going to ask this morning if you would just go ahead, zip up your Bibles, close them, put your bulletin to the side. I'm going to close with some scripture, but I don't want anything to be a distraction to you. I want to have your sole attention on the screen behind me. So just go ahead, put everything in place, get ready to, to wrap it up here. But as I read these verses, I want your attention right here with me, okay? Because what I'm getting ready to read to you is such an important passage of Scripture. We studied it last year as we were going through the Gospel of John. And it's Christ's longest recorded prayer. And it happens on just hours before he's arrested and hung on a cross. And this is what's on his heart more than anything else before he was to die and to leave this world. He says in John chapter 17, starting in verse 13, But now I'm coming to you, and I say these things in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I'm not of this world. I do not pray that you would take them out of this world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even, though, even as I am not of this world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth of your word, is what he's saying. Verse 20, and I love it. I do not pray for these alone, but I also pray for those who will believe in me through their word. And here's the key. This is what's on Jesus' heart more than anything. That they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, may they also be one in us. 
that the world may believe that you sent me. You see, Jesus knows that our effective witness is going to be based upon our ability to remain united. He says it, verse 20, that the world may believe. Why am I praying for them to be one? That the world may believe that you sent me. It's important for us to maintain unity here at Burnside Christian Church. The unity of this body is supremely important to Jesus Christ. And so what we're going to do here this morning to close things out, we're going to have a song of decision in just a second. But I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to ask you to pray with me for unity here at Burnside Christian Church. To put aside our complaints, to cling to what is greater and grander and more noble, and that is Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have our time of decision here this morning. Let's pray. God, we counted a privilege to be a part of a church, your body, your bride. And for us to honor your name rightly, to be a good representation in the community, to be strong ambassadors for your word. And uh, Father, I would just ask that you would help us to do that to the very best of our ability. Father, that you would forgive us at times when we've messed that up because of our own selfishness because of our own uh, pride, because of our own need to be right. God, I pray in humility that you would help us to um, mend bridges and to get along. And thank you, Father, for your standard of truth. Father, this morning I pray for uh, your witness and your namesake, that, Father, we might uh, serve both of those things rightly. Thank you for the ministry that's taking place at Burnside. Uh, I'm thankful for those who are willing to step in and serve so that your word may continue to be spread. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.